Russian-European Union relations are the international relations between the European Union EU and its largest bordering state, Russia, to the east. The relations of individual member states of the European Union and Russia vary, though a 1990s common foreign policy outline towards Russia was the first such EU foreign policy agreed. Furthermore, four European Union-Russia common spaces are agreed as a framework for establishing better relations. The latest EU-Russia strategic partnership was signed in 2011, but it was later challenged by the European Parliament in 2015 following the annexation of Crimea and the war in Donbass. Topic. Comparison Topic. Gas disputes The Russia-Ukraine gas dispute of 2009 damaged Russia's reputation as a gas supplier. After a deal was struck between Ukraine and the EU on 23 March 2009 to upgrade Ukraine's gas pipelines Russian Prime Minister Vladimir Putin threatened to review Russia's relations with the EU. If Russia's interests are ignored, we will also have to start reviewing the fundamentals of our relations. Putin stated, according to Russian Energy Minister Sergei Shmatko the plan appeared to draw Ukraine legally closer to the European Union and might harm Moscow's interests. The Russian Foreign Ministry called the deal, an unfriendly act, on 26 March 2009. Professor Irina Bizigina of the Moscow State Institution for Foreign Relations has said that Russia has better relations with certain leaders of some EU countries than with the EU as a whole because the EU has no prospect of a common foreign policy. In September 2012, the European Commission (EC) opened an antitrust investigation relating to Gazprom's contracts in Central and Eastern Europe. Russia responded by enacting, also in September 2012, legislation hindering foreign investigations. In 2013, the poorest members of the EU usually paid the highest prices for gas from Gazprom. The Commission's investigation was delayed due to Russia's military intervention in Ukraine. In April 2015, the EC accused Gazprom of unfair pricing and restricting competition. The European Commissioner for Competition, Margaret Vestager, stated that, all companies that operate in the European market, no matter if they are European or not, have to play by EU rules. I am concerned that Gazprom is breaking EU antitrust rules by abusing its dominant position on EU gas markets. Gazprom said it was, outside of the jurisdiction of the EU, and described itself as, a company which in accordance with the Russian legislation performs functions of public interest and has a status of strategic state-controlled entity." Lithuanian President Dalia Griborskate said that the Kremlin was using Gazprom as a tool of political and economic blackmail in Europe. Tensions over association agreements The run-up to the 2013 Vilnius summit between the EU and its eastern neighbours saw what The Economist called a «raw geopolitical contest» not seen in Europe since the end of the Cold War, as Russia attempted to persuade countries in its «near abroad» to join its new Eurasian Union rather than sign association agreements with the EU. The Russian government under President Putin succeeded in convincing Armenia in September and Ukraine in November to halt talks with the EU and instead begin negotiations with Russia. Nevertheless, the EU summit went ahead with Moldova and Georgia proceeding towards agreements with the EU despite Russia's opposition. Widespread protests in Ukraine resulted in then-President Viktor Yanukovych leaving Ukraine for Russia in February 2014. Russia subsequently began a military intervention in Ukraine. This action was condemned as an invasion by the European Union, which imposed visa bans and asset freezes against some Russian officials. The Council of the European Union stated that, Russia's violation of international law and the destabilization of Ukraine challenge the European security order at its core. Russia views some of the countries that applied to join the EU or NATO after the fall of the Iron Curtain as part of its sphere of influence. It has criticized their admission and frequently said that NATO is moving its infrastructure closer to the Russian border. 
The expansion of NATO into the Baltic states of Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia as well as the proposed ascension of Georgia and Ukraine are among Russia's main claims to NATO's encroachment of its sphere of influence. NATO Deputy Secretary General Alexander Vershbo responded that NATO's major military infrastructure in Eastern Europe is no closer to the Russian border than since the end of the Cold War, and that Russia itself maintains a large military presence in neighboring countries. Topic: <laughs> Russian political influence and financial links. Moscow increased its efforts to expand its political influence using a wide range of methods, including funding of political movements in Europe, increased spending on propaganda in European languages, operating a range of media broadcasting in EU languages and web brigades, with some observers suspecting the Kremlin of trying to weaken the EU and its response to the Ukrainian crisis. Russia has formed close ties with Eurosceptic and populist parties belonging to both ends of the political spectrum. By the end of 2014, a number of European far-right and far-left parties were receiving different forms of financial or organizational support from Russia in an attempt to build a common anti-European and pro-Russian front in the European Union. Unlike in the Cold War, when Soviets largely supported leftist groups, a fluid approach to ideology now allows the Kremlin to simultaneously back far-left and far-right movements, Greens, anti-globalists and financial elites. The aim is to exacerbate divides and create an echo chamber of Kremlin support. Among the far-right parties involved were the Freedom Party of Austria Euro, Alternative for Germany AFD, National Democratic Party of Germany NPD, France's National Front, Italy's Lega Nord, Hungary's Jobbik, Bulgaria's Attack Attica, and Latvian Russian Union. Among far-left parties, representatives of Die Linke, Communist Party of Greece, Syriza and others attended numerous events organized by Russia such as conservative conferences", and the Crimean referendum. In the Europarliament, the European United Left Nordic Green Left are described as reliable partner of Russian politics, voting against resolutions condemning events such as Russia's military intervention in Ukraine, and supporting Russian policies e.g. in Syria. Konstantin Rykov and Timur Prokopenko, both closely tied to United Russia and Russian Federation's presidential administration, were the key figures in funneling money to these parties. Agents France Press stated that, "...from the far right to the radical left, populist parties across Europe are being courted by Russia's Vladimir Putin who aims to turn them into allies in his anti-EU campaign," and that, "...a majority of European populist parties have sided with Russia over Ukraine." During the Russian military intervention in Ukraine, British politicians Nigel Farage of the far right and Jeremy Corbyn of the far left both defended Russia, saying the West had, "...provoked." It, Luke Harding wrote in The Guardian that the Front National's MEPs were a pro Russian bloc. In 2014, the Nouvelle Observateur said that the Russian government considered the Front National capable of seizing power in France and changing the course of European history in Moscow's favor. According to the French media, party leaders had frequent contact with Russian Ambassador Alexander Orlov and Marine Le Pen made multiple trips to Moscow. In November 2014, Marine Le Pen confirmed a €9 million Euros loan from a Russian bank to the Front National. The Independent said the loans, "...take Moscow's attempt to influence the internal politics of the EU to a new level." Reinhard Butikofer stated, "...it's remarkable that a political party from the motherland of freedom can be funded by Putin's sphere, the largest European enemy of freedom." Boris Kagalitsky said, if any foreign bank gave loans to a Russian political party, it would have been illegal, or at least it would have been an issue which could lead to a lot of scandal." And the party would be required to register as a "...foreign agent." Le Pen denied a Mediapart report that a senior Front National member said it was the first installment of a €40 million Euros loan. In April 2015, a Russian hacker group published texts and emails between Timur Prokopenko, a member of Putin's administration, and Konstantin Rykov, a former Duma deputy with ties to France, discussing Russian financial support to the Front National in exchange for its support of Russia's annexation of Crimea. In June 2015, Marine Le Pen launched a new political group within the EU Parliament, Europe of Nations and Freedom (ENF), composed of members of the Front National Party for Freedom (Lega Nord), the Freedom Party of Austria Uro, Flemish Interest VB, the Congress of the New Right KNP, and Vlaams Belang. 
Reviewing votes in the EU Parliament on resolutions critical of Russia or measures not in the Kremlin's interests e.g., the EU-Ukraine Association Agreement, Hungary's political capital institute found that the future ENF members voted no. In 93% of cases, European United Left Nordic Green Left in 78% of cases, and Europe of Freedom and Direct Democracy in 67% of cases. The writers stated that, it would therefore be logical to conclude, as others have done before, that there is a pro-Putin coalition in the European Parliament consisting of anti-EU and radical parties. The Financial Times and Radio Free Europe reported on Syriza's ties with Russia and extensive correspondence with Alexander Dugan, who called for a «genocide» of Ukrainians. The U Observer reported that Tsipras had a «pro-Russia track record» and that Syriza's MEPs had voted against the Ukraine-European Union Association Agreement, criticism of the Russian annexation of Crimea, and criticism of the pressure on civil rights group Memorial. The Moscow Times stated that, "...the terms used in Russia's anti-Europe rhetoric also seem to have infiltrated Sipras' vocabulary." Russia also developed ties with Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban Fetus, who praised Vladimir Putin's, "...a liberal democracy." and was described by Germany's former foreign minister Joschka Fischer as a «Putinist». Hungary allowed a Russian billionaire to renovate a memorial in Budapest, which some Hungarians called illegal, to Soviet soldiers who died fighting against the Hungarian Revolution of 1956, and Putin visited it in February 2015. Orban's government dropped plans to put the expansion of the Pax nuclear power plant out to tender and awarded the contract to Rosatom after Russia offered a generous loan. Zoltan Ehlers said that Russia was buying influence. Two new organizations, European Centre for Geopolitical Analysis and Agency for Security and Cooperation in Europe, ASCE, recruiting mostly European far-right politicians, were also heavily involved in positive public relations during the 2014 Russian military intervention in Ukraine, observing Donbass general elections and presenting a pro-Russian point of view on various events there. In 2014, a number of officials in Europe and NATO provided circumstantial evidence that protests against hydraulic fracturing may be sponsored by Gazprom. Russian officials have on numerous occasions warned Europe that fracking poses a huge environmental problem. In spite of Gazprom itself being involved in shale gas surveys in Romania and not facing any protests, and reacted aggressively to any criticism by environmental organizations, a significant part of the funding of anti-EU and extremist parties passes through St. Basil the Great Fund operated by Konstantin Malafeyev. In February 2015, a group of Spanish nationals was arrested in Madrid for joining a Russian-backed armed group in the war in Donbass. Traveling through Moscow, they were met by a government official and sent to Donetsk, where they saw French and other foreign fighters, half of them communists, half Nazis. In March 2015, the Russian Nationalist Party Rodina organized the International Russian Conservative Forum in St. Petersburg, inviting a majority of its far right and far left, including openly neo Nazi supporters from abroad, many of whom had visited a similar event in Crimea in 2014 Udo Voigt, Jim Dowson, Nick Griffin, Jared Taylor, Roberto Fiore, Georgios Epitidios, Golden Dawn, and others. Since 2012, a fund created by the Foreign Affairs Ministry of Russia, Fund for the Legal Protection, and support of Russian Federation compatriots living abroad, has transferred €224,000 to the Latvian Human Rights Committee, which was founded by pro-Russian politician Tijana Zdanoka. Latvia's Televisia reported that only projects which supported Russia's foreign policy objectives were eligible for funding. In June 2015, the European Parliament stated that Russia was supporting and financing radical and extremist parties in the EU and called for monitoring of such activities. France's National Front, UKIP, and Jobbik voted against the resolution. These and other extreme-right organizations are part of Russia-sponsored World National Conservative Movement. In July 2016, Estonian Foreign Affairs Minister Marina Kaljurin said, The parade that we have seen of former and current European leaders to Moscow calling for rapprochement and tacitly agreeing to the dismantling of Europe, has been disheartening for those of us who understand that a unified Europe with a strong American partnership is the only reason we have a choice at all about where our futures should be. In June 2016, Czech Foreign Minister Lubomir Zaorilek stated that Russia was supporting right-wing populists to divide and conquer 
The EU. In October 2016, the EU held talks on Russian funding of far right and populist parties. In 2018, Czech counterintelligence service BIS published a report documenting significant increase of activity of Russia and China backed actors to influence regulators and political bodies. Topic. Allegations of Russian intimidation and destabilization of EU states In July 2009, Central and Eastern European leaders, including former presidents Václav Havel, Valdas Adamkus, Alexander Kwasniewski, Vera Vykfryvoga, Lech Wałęsa, signed an open letter stating our hopes that relations with Russia would improve and that Moscow would finally fully accept our complete sovereignty and independence after joining NATO and the EU have not been fulfilled. Instead, Russia is back as a revisionist power pursuing a 19th-century agenda with 21st-century tactics and methods. It challenges our claims to our own historical experiences. It asserts a privileged position in determining our security choices. It uses overt and covert means of economic warfare, ranging from energy blockades and politically motivated investments to bribery and media manipulation in order to advance its interests and to challenge the transatlantic orientation of Central and Eastern Europe. Latvian journalist Olga Dragoyeva stated that Russian language media controlled by the Russian government and NGOs connected with Russia have been cultivating dissatisfaction among the Russian speaking part of the population. In Latvia, national security agencies in Lithuania, Estonia, and Latvia have linked Moscow to local pro Russian groups. In June 2015, a Chatham House report stated that Russia used a wide range of hostile measures against its neighbors including energy cutoffs, trade embargoes, subversive use of Russian minorities, malicious cyber activity, and co-option of business and political elites. In 2015, the UK media said that the Russian leadership under Putin saw the fracturing of the political unity within the EU and especially the political unity between the EU and the US as among its main strategic goals, one of the means in achieving this goal being rendering support to Europe's far-right and hard Eurosceptic political parties. In October 2015, Putin said that Washington treated European countries like vassals who are being punished, rather than allies. In November 2015, the president of Bulgaria, Rosen Plevnilev, said that Russia had launched a massive hybrid warfare campaign aimed at destabilizing the whole of Europe, giving repeated violations of Bulgarian airspace and cyber attacks as examples. In January 2016, senior UK government officials were reported to have registered their growing fears that a new Cold War was now unfolding in Europe, with Russian meddling allegedly taking on a breadth, range and depth greater than previously thought. It really is a new Cold War out there. Right across the EU we are seeing alarming evidence of Russian efforts to unpick the fabric of European unity on a whole range of vital strategic issues. The situation prompted the U.S. Congress to instruct James R. Clapper, the U.S. Director of National Intelligence, to conduct a major review of Russian clandestine funding of European parties over the previous decade. On numerous occasions, Russia was also accused of actively supporting United Kingdom withdrawal from the European Union through channels such as Russia Today and Russian Federation Embassy in London. An analysis of the Russian government's English language news service, Sputnik, found a systematic bias in favor of the out campaign which was too consistent to be the result of accident or error." In February 2016, a film circulating in Hungary, in which recruited students expressed anger at the policy of the USA, was identified as a version of a Russian movie with the same script funded by a pro-Putin organization, Officers' Daughters. Published in March 2016, Swedish security service SAPO's annual report stated that Russia was engaged in "...psychological warfare," using extreme movements, information operations and misinformation campaigns aimed at policy makers and the general public. In June 2016, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov stated that Russia will never attack any NATO country, saying, I am convinced that all serious and honest politicians know perfectly well that Russia will never attack a member state of NATO. We have no such plans. He also said, in our security doctrine it is clearly stated that one of the main threats to our safety is the further expansion of NATO to the east. 
In late 2016 media in a number of states accused Russia of preparing grounds for a possible armed takeover at their territories in future, including Finland, Estonia and Montenegro. In the latter an armed coup was actually in progress but prevented by security services on the day of election on 16 October, with over 20 people arrested. A group of 20 citizens of Serbia and Montenegro, planned to break into the Montenegro parliament on election day, kill Prime Minister Milo Dukanovic and bring a pro-Russian coalition to power. According to Montenegro Chief Prosecutor Milivoya Katnik, adding that the group was led by two Russian citizens who fled the country before the arrest and unspecified number of Russian operatives in Serbia who were deported shortly after. A few days after the failed coup Leonid Reshetnikov was dismissed by Putin from his duties as head of Russian Institute for Strategic Studies, which also had its branch in Belgrade where it supported anti-NATO and pro-Russian parties. In 2017 a cache of email was leaked demonstrating funding of far-right and far-left movements in Europe through a Belarusian citizen Alexander Yusovsky who funneled hundreds of thousands of euros from Russian nationalist and oligarch Konstantin Malafayev and reporting to Russian State Duma Deputy Konstantin Zachalin. Yusovsky confirmed the authenticity of the emails. In 2017, three Alternative for Germany parliamentary deputies confirmed that they together received $29.000 in sponsored private jet visit to Moscow, which caused significant controversy in Germany. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Intelligence activities. A Russian spy, Sergei Cherepanov, operated in Spain from the 1990s to June 2010 under a false identity, Henry Frith. In its 2013 report, the Security Information Service noted the presence of an extremely high number of Russian intelligence officers in the Czech Republic. The Swedish Security Service's 2014 annual report named Russia as the biggest intelligence threat, describing its espionage against Sweden as extensive. According to a May 2016 report for the European Council on Foreign Relations, Russia was engaged in massive and voracious intelligence gathering campaigns, fueled by still substantial budgets and a Kremlin culture that sees deceit and secret agendas even where none exist. One of the main figures perceived as European far right and far left contact in Russia is Sergei Narishkin, who in 2016 was appointed as the chief of Russia's Foreign Intelligence Service (SVR). In 2018, the head of British MI6 warned that perpetual confrontation with the West is core feature of Russian foreign policy. Topic: <laughs> Cyber attacks. In 2007, following the Estonian government's decision to remove a statue of a Soviet soldier, the Baltic country's major commercial banks, government agencies, media outlets, and ATMs were targeted by a coordinated cyber attack which was later traced to Russia. In April 2015, the French television channel TV5 Monde was targeted by a cyber attack which claimed to represent ISIL but French sources said their investigation was leading to Russia. In May 2015, the Bundestag's computer system was shut down for days due to a cyber attack carried out by a hacker group that was likely being steered by the Russian state, according to the Federal Office for the Protection of the Constitution in Germany. The agency head, Hans Georg Maren, said that, in addition to spying, lately Russian intelligence agencies have also shown a willingness to conduct sabotage. British Prime Minister Theresa May accused Russia of threatening the international order, seeking to weaponize information, and deploying its state-run media organizations to plant fake stories. She mentioned Russia's meddling in German federal election in 2017, after German government officials and security experts said there was no Russian interference. Concerns about foreign influence in the 2018 Swedish general election have been raised by the Swedish Security Service and others, leading to various countermeasures. According to the Oxford Internet Institute, eight of the top ten junk news sources during the election campaign were Swedish, and Russian sources comprised less than 1% of the total number of URLs shared in the data sample. <laughs> <laughs> Military and nuclear In 2009, W. Prost reported that Russian military exercises had included a simulated nuclear attack on Poland. In June 2012, Russian General Nikolai Makarov said that, "...cooperation between Finland and NATO threatens Russia's security. 
Finland should not desire NATO membership, rather it should preferably have closer military cooperation with Russia." In response, Finnish Prime Minister Jyrki Katainen said that, "...Finland will make its own decisions and do what is best for Finland. Such decisions will not be left to Russian generals." In April 2013, Svenska Dagbladet reported that Russia had simulated a bombing run in March on the Stockholm region and southern Sweden, using two Tu-22 M3 backfire heavy bombers and four Su-27 flanker fighter jets. A nuclear attack against Sweden was part of the training exercises. In May 2014, Russia's Deputy Prime Minister Dmitry Rogozin joked that he would return in a Tu-160 after his plane was barred from Romania's airspace. Requesting an explanation, Romania's foreign ministry stated that, "...the threat of using a Russian strategic bomber plane by a Russian deputy prime minister is a very grave statement under the current regional context." Rogozin has also stated that Russia's defense sector has, "...many other ways of traveling the world besides tourist visas," and, "...tanks don't need visas." In October 2014, Denmark's Defense Intelligence Service stated that in June of the same year Russian military jets, equipped with live missiles, had simulated an attack on the island of Bornholm as 90,000 people visited for the annual Fokemodet meeting. In November 2014, the European Leadership Network reviewed 40 incidents involving Russia in a report titled Dangerous Brinkmanship, finding that they add up to a highly disturbing picture of violations of national airspace, emergency scrambles, narrowly avoided mid-air collisions, close encounters at sea, simulated attack runs, and other dangerous actions happening on a regular basis over a very wide geographical area." In March 2015, Russia's ambassador to Denmark, Mikhail Vannin, stated that Danish warship, "...will be targets for Russian missiles," if the country joined NATO's missile defense system. Danish Foreign Minister Martin Lidegaard said the statements were "...inacceptable," and "...crossed the line." A few days later, Russian Foreign Ministry spokesman Alexander Lukashevich said that Russia could "...neutralize," a missile defense system in Denmark. In April 2015, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, Finland, and Iceland decided to increase their military cooperation, telling Aftenposten. The Russian military are acting in a challenging way along our borders, and there have been several infringes on the borders of the Baltic nations. Russia's propaganda and political manoeuvring are contributing to sowing discord between the nations, as well as inside organizations like NATO and the EU." In June 2015, Russia's ambassador to Sweden, Viktor Tartarinsev, told Dagens Nyata that if Sweden joins NATO, there will be countermeasures. Putin pointed out that there will be consequences, that Russia will have to resort to a response of the military kind and reorientate our troops and missiles." In April 2015, the Russian Navy disrupted Nordbort cable laying in Lithuania's exclusive economic zone. From April 2013 to November 2015, Russia held seven large-scale military exercises 65,000 to 160,000 personnel whereas NATO exercises were generally much smaller in size, with the largest composed of 36,000 personnel. Estonia criticized Russia's military exercises, saying that they «dwarfed» NATO's and were offensive rather than defensive. Simulating the invasion of its neighbors, the destruction and seizure of critical military and economic infrastructure, and targeted nuclear strikes on NATO allies and partners. In 2016, Sweden revised its military strategy doctrine. Parliamentary Defense Committee Chairman Alan Whitman stated, The old military doctrine was shaped after the last Cold War when Sweden believed that Russia was on the road to becoming a real democracy that would no longer pose a threat to this country and its neighbors. In April 2016, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov stated that Russia would have to take the necessary military technical action. If Sweden joined NATO, Swedish Prime Minister Stefan Löfven responded, we demand respect in the same way that we respect other countries' decisions about their security and defense policies." Russian military activities in Ukraine and Georgia caused particular alarm in countries which are geographically close to Russia and those which experienced decades of Soviet military occupation. Poland's Foreign Minister Witold Waszczykowski stated. We have to reject any type of wishful thinking with regard to pragmatic cooperation with Russia as long as it keeps on invading its neighbors." 
Following the annexation of Crimea, Lithuania reinstated conscription, increased its defense spending, called on NATO to deploy more troops to the Baltics, and published three guides on surviving emergencies and war. Lithuanian President Dalia Griborskate stated, I think that Russia is terrorizing its neighbors and using terrorist methods. Estonia increased training of Estonian Defence League members and encouraged more citizens to own guns. Brigadier General Milis Keely stated, "...the best deterrent is not only armed soldiers, but armed citizens, too." In March 2017, Sweden decided to reintroduce conscription due to Russia's military drills in the Baltics and aggression in Ukraine. In his speech at the Rusi Land Warfare Conference in June 2018, the Chief of the General Staff Mark Carlton Smith said that British troops should be prepared to fight and win against the imminent threat of hostile Russia. Carlton Smith said, the misplaced perception that there is no imminent or existential threat to the UK, and that even if there was it could only arise at long notice, is wrong, along with a flawed belief that conventional hardware and mass are irrelevant in countering Russian subversion. In a November 2018 interview with the Daily Telegraph, Carlton Smith said that Russia today indisputably represents a far greater threat to our national security than Islamic extremist threats such as Al Qaeda and ISIL. We cannot be complacent about the threat Russia poses or leave it uncontested. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Poisoning and abduction. Alexander Litvinenko, who had defected from the FSB and become a British citizen, died from radioactive polonium-210 poisoning carried out in England in November 2006. Relations between the UK and Russia cooled after a British murder investigation indicated that Russia's Federal Protective Service was behind his poisoning. In September 2014, the FSB crossed into Estonia and abducted Esten Kova, an officer of the Estonian Internal Security Service. Brian Whitmore of Radio Free Europe stated that the case "...illustrates the Kremlin's campaign to intimidate its neighbours, flout global rules and norms, and test NATO's defences and responses." On 4 March 2018, Sergei Skripal, a former Russian military intelligence officer who acted as a double agent for the UK's intelligence services in the 1990s and early 2000s, and his daughter Yulia were poisoned with a Novichok nerve agent in Salisbury, England. The UK Prime Minister Theresa May requested a Russian explanation by the end of 13 March 2018. She said that the UK government would "...consider in detail the response from the Russian state." And in the event that there was no credible response, the government would conclude that this action amounts to an unlawful use of force by the Russian state against the United Kingdom, and measures would follow. Topic: <laughs> Use of migration issues. In January 2016, several Finnish authorities suspected that Russians were enabling migrants to enter Finland, and YLE, the national public broadcasting company, reported that a Russian border guard had admitted the Federal Security Service's involvement. In March, NATO General Philip Breedlove stated, "...together, Russia and the Assad regime are deliberately weaponizing migration in an attempt to overwhelm European structures and break European resolve." A Russian state-run channel, supported by Sergei Lavrov, broadcast a false story that a 13-year-old German-Russian girl who had briefly disappeared had been raped by migrants in Berlin and that German officials were covering it up. Germany's foreign minister suggested that Russia was using the case for political propaganda, and to inflame and influence what is already a difficult debate about migration within Germany. Russian propaganda. Russian government-funded media and political organizations have primarily targeted far-right circles in Europe, attempting to create an image of Russia as the last defender of traditional, conservative and Christian values. Putin, in his annual address at the end of 2013, when defending the discriminative anti-gay propaganda law from international criticism before the Sochi Olympic Games, practically put Russia in the role of the global moral compass of conservatism. Putin claimed that banning propaganda of non-traditional relations should not be regarded as discriminative it is only about strengthening traditional family values which is a guarantee of russia's greatness he also downplayed the western approach of so-called tolerance genderless and infertile and said that the destruction of traditional values from the top in the west is 
Inherently undemocratic because it is based on abstract ideas and runs counter to the will of the majority of people. Russian and pro-Russian media and organizations have produced fake stories and distorted real events. One of the most widely distributed fake stories was that of 13-year-old Lisa F. In March 2017 a Russian TV team reportedly paid Swedish teenagers to stage a scene of anti-government protests in Rinkeby. The scale of this campaign resulted in a number of EU countries taking individual actions. The Czech Republic noted that Russia had set up about 40 Czech language websites publishing conspiracy theories and false reports. According to the State Secretary for European Affairs, the key goal of Russian propaganda in the Czech Republic is to sow doubts into the minds of the people that democracy is the best system to organize a country, to build negative images of the European Union and NATO, and to discourage people from participation in the democratic processes. An analyst for the Lithuanian military stated, We have a pretty huge and long lasting disinformation campaign against our society. Lithuania has given three-month bans to Russian channels, Foreign Minister Linas Linkvicius stated, A lie is not an alternative point of view. The head of Finland's governmental communication department, Marku Mantila, said that Russian propaganda sought to create suspicions against Finland's leaders, the European Union, and NATO. He stated, There is a systematic lying campaign going on. It is not a question of bad journalism, I believe it is controlled from the centre. In November 2016, the EU Parliament passed an anti-propaganda resolution. EU Disinformation Review is a news feed analyzing and debunking most notable fake stories distributed in Russian media. In 2018 the European Commission initiated a new action plan to counter "...disinformation that fuels hatred, division, and mistrust in democracy," as well as interference with elections, "...with evidence pointing to Russia as a primary source of these campaigns." Topic. Russian minorities in the EU The OSCE mission monitoring the 2006 parliamentary elections in Latvia mentioned that As reported by the European Commissioner for Human Rights 2007 report on Latvia, in 2006 there were 411,054 non-citizens, 66.5% of them belonging to Russian minority. In 2017, there were 0.9 million ethnic Russians in the Baltic states, having declined from 1.7 million in 1989, the year of the last census during the Soviet era. Beginning in 2019, instruction in Russian language will be gradually discontinued in private colleges and universities in Latvia, as well as general instruction in Latvian public high schools, except for subjects related to culture and history of the Russian minority, such as Russian language and literature classes. Topic. Russian organized crime in the EU In 2015, a Spanish investigation found links between Russian politicians, including allies of Vladimir Putin, and organized crime in Spain. In May 2016, a Spanish judge issued arrest warrants for Russian government officials close to Putin. In late June, Spanish authorities arrested seven people implicated in a money laundering ring with connections to United Russia, Russia's ruling political party. In January 2016, there were allegations that the Russian mafia was concealing money in Irish Financial Services Center funds and land in Ireland. Topic: Trade. The EU is Russia's largest trading partner, accounting for 52.3% of all foreign Russian trade in 2008 and 75% of foreign direct investment FDI stocks in Russia also come from the EU. The EU exported €105 billion Euros of goods to Russia in 2008 and Russia exported €173.2 billion Euros to the EU, 68.2% of Russian exports to the EU are accounted for by energy and fuel supplies. For details on other trade, see the table below. Russia and the EU are both members of the World Trade Organization WTO. The EU and Russia are currently implementing the Common Spaces see below, a negotiation to replace the current partnership and cooperation agreement to strengthen bilateral trade. Topic. Other issues
Topic: <laughs> Kaliningrad. The Russian exclave of Kaliningrad Oblast has, since 2004, been surrounded on land by EU members. As a result, the oblast has been isolated from the rest of the Federation due to stricter border controls that had to be brought in when Poland and Lithuania joined the EU and further tightened before they joined the Schengen area. The new difficulties for Russians in Kaliningrad to reach the rest of Russia is a small source of tension. In July 2011 the European Commission put forward proposals to classify the whole of Kaliningrad as a border area. This would allow Poland and Lithuania to issue special permits for Kaliningrad residents to pass through those two countries without requiring a Schengen visa. 2012–2016 visa-free travels were allowed between Kaliningrad region and northern Poland. <inaudible> <inaudible> Energy Russia has a significant role in the European energy sector as the largest exporter of oil and natural gas to the EU. In 2007, the EU imported from Russia 185 million tons of crude oil, which accounted for 32.6% of total oil imports, and 100.7 million tons of oil equivalent of natural gas, which accounted for 38.7% of total gas imports. A number of disputes in which Russia was using pipeline shutdowns in what was described as tool for intimidation and blackmail," caused European Union to significantly increase efforts to diversify its energy sources. During an anti-trust investigation initiated in 2011 against Gazprom a number of internal company documents were seized that documented a number of "...abusive practices," in an attempt to "...segment the internal EU market along national borders," and impose "...unfair pricing." Topic. Siberian flights There have been agreements on other matters such as the withdrawal of taxes on EU flights over Siberia. Topic. Meat from Poland Further problems include a ban by Russia on Polish meat exports, due to allegations of low-quality and unsafe meat exported from the country, which caused Poland to veto proposed EU-Russia pacts concerning issues such as energy and migration, an oil blockade on Lithuania, and concerns by Latvia and Poland on the Nord Stream pipeline. In 2007 Polish meat was allowed to be exported to Russia. Topic. 2014 Russian food embargo Announced 6 August 2014 by President Putin. Russia banned European food imports in response to EU sanctions. Topic. Partnership and cooperation agreement The legal basis for the relations between the EU and Russia is the Partnership and Cooperation Agreement PCA. Signed in June 1994 and in force since December 1997, the PCA was supposed to be valid for 10 years. Thus, since 2007 it is annually automatically renewed, until replaced by a new agreement. The PCA provides a political, economic and cultural framework for relations between Russia and the EU. It is primarily concerned with promoting trade, investment and harmonious economic relations. However, it also mentions the parties shared ah, aspect for democratic principles and human rights as defined in particular in the Helsinki Final Act and the Charter of Paris for a New Europe, and a commitment to international peace and security. A replacement agreement has been under negotiations since 2008 and following that and WTO entry, a more detailed agreement will be negotiated. Russian exports to the EU have very few restrictions, except for the steel sector. Topic. The four common spaces Russia has chosen not to participate in the European Union's European Neighborhood Policy ENP, as it aspires to be an equal partner of the EU, as opposed to the junior partnership that Russia sees in the ENP. Consequently, Russia and the European Union agreed to create four common spaces for cooperation in different spheres. In practice there are no substantial differences besides naming between the sum of these agreements and the ENP action plans adopted jointly by the EU and its ENP partner states. 
In both cases the final agreement is based on provisions from the EU Acquis Commune out air and is jointly discussed and adopted. For this reason, the common spaces receive funding from the European Neighbourhood and Partnership Instrument ENPI, which also funds the ENP. At the St. Petersburg summit in May 2003, the EU and Russia agreed to reinforce their cooperation by creating, in the long term, four common spaces in the framework of the Partnership and Cooperation Agreement of 1997, a common economic space, a common space of freedom, security and justice, a space of cooperation in the field of external security, and a space of research, education, and cultural exchange. The Moscow summit in May 2005 adopted a single package of road maps for the creation of the four common spaces. These expand on the ongoing cooperation as described above, set out further specific objectives, and determine the actions necessary to make the common spaces a reality. They thereby determine the agenda for cooperation between the EU and Russia for the medium term. The London summit in October 2005 focused on the practical implementation of the road maps for the four common spaces. Topic: Common economic space. The objective of the common economic space is to create an open and integrated market between the EU and Russia. This space is intended to remove barriers to trade and investment and promote reforms and competitiveness, based on the principles of non-discrimination, transparency, and good governance. Among the wide range of actions foreseen, a number of new dialogues are to be launched. Cooperation will be stepped up on regulatory policy, investment issues, competition, financial services, telecommunications, transport, energy, space activities and space launching, etc. Environment issues including nuclear safety and the implementation of the Kyoto Protocol also figure prominently. Topic. Common space of freedom, security and justice Work on this space has already made a large step forward with the conclusion of negotiations on the visa facilitation and the readmission agreements. Both the EU and Russia are in the process of ratifying these agreements. The visa dialogue will continue with a view to examine the conditions for a mutual visa-free travel regime as a long-term perspective. In a 15 December 2011 statement given after an EU-Russia summit, the President of the European Commission confirmed the launch of the common steps towards visa-free travel with Russia. Russia hopes to sign a deal on visa-free travel as early as January 2014. Cooperation on combating terrorism and other forms of international illegal activities such as money laundering, the fight against drugs and trafficking in human beings will continue as well as on document security through the introduction of biometric features in a range of identity documents. The EU support to border management and reform of the Russian judiciary system are among the highlights of this space. With a view to contributing to the concrete implementation of the roadmap, the Justice and Home Affairs PPC met on 13 October 2005 and agreed to organize clusters of conferences and seminars, bringing together experts and practitioners on counterterrorism, cyber crime, document security and judicial cooperation. There was also agreement about developing greater cooperation between the European Border Agency FRONTEX, and the Federal Border Security Service of Russia. Topic. Common space on external security The roadmap underlines the shared responsibility of the parties for an international order based on effective multilateralism, their support for the central role of the UN, and for the effectiveness in particular of the OSCE and the Council of Europe. The parties will strengthen their cooperation on security and crisis management in order to address global and regional challenges and key threats, notably terrorism and the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction WMD. They will give particular attention to securing stability in the regions adjacent to Russian and EU borders the frozen conflicts in Transnistria, Abkhazia, South Ossetia, Nagorno-Karabakh. EU activities in this area are done in the framework of its common foreign and security policy. Topic. Common space on research, education, culture 
This space builds on the long-standing relations with Russia through its participation in EU research and development activities and the 6th FPRD in particular, and under the TEMPUS program. It aims at capitalizing on the strength of the EU and Russian research communities and cultural and intellectual heritage by reinforcing links between research and innovation and closer cooperation on education such as through convergence of university curricula and qualifications. It also lays a firm basis for cooperation in the cultural field. A European Studies Institute co-financed by both sides will be set up in Moscow for the start of the academic year 2006 7 Russia and the EU continue to work together under Horizon 2020, which runs from 2014 to 2020. Topic. Visa liberalization dialogue On 4 May 2010, the EU and Russian Federation raised the prospect of beginning negotiations on a visa-free regime between their territories. However it was announced by the Council of Ministers of the EU that the EU is not completely ready to open up the borders due to high risk of increase in human trafficking and drug imports into Europe and because of the loose borders of Russia with Kazakhstan. They will instead work towards providing Russia with a roadmap for visa-free travel. While this does not legally bind the EU to providing visa-free access to the Schengen area for Russian citizens at any specific date in the future, it does greatly improve the chances of a new regime being established and obliges the EU to actively consider the notion, should the terms of the roadmap be met. Russia on the other hand has agreed that should the roadmap be established, it will ease access for EU citizens for whom access is not visa-free at this point, largely as a result of Russian foreign policy which states that Visa-free travel must be reciprocal between states. Both the EU and Russia acknowledge, however, that there are many problems to be solved before visa-free travel is introduced. The dialogue was temporarily frozen by the EU in March 2014 during the 2014 Crimean crisis. In 2015, Jean-Maurice Ripet, the current French ambassador to Russia, stated that France would be interested in abolishing short-term SS Hengen visas for Russians. In 2016, the Spanish Minister of Industry José Manuel Soria made a similar statement on behalf of Spain. In June 2016, EEAS released a Russian language video describing the necessary conditions for the visa-free regime. The same year, a number of EU officials, including the head of EEAS Russia Division Fernando Andresen Guimarães, said that they would like to restart negotiations on visa abolishment. The Czech president Milos Zeman also spoke out in favor of visa-free regime for Russians. On the 24th of May 2016, the German think tank DGAP released a report called "The Eastern Question: Recommendations for Western Policy." Discussing the renewed Western strategy towards Russia in the wake of increased tensions between Putin's regime and EU. Their recommendations include visa liberalization for Russian citizens in order to improve people-to-people -people contacts and to send a strong signal that there is no conflict with Russian society. Likewise, the chairman of Munich Security Conference Wolfgang Ischinger suggested granting visa-free entry to countries of the Schengen area for ordinary Russian citizens, who are not to blame for the Ukrainian crisis and have nothing to do with sanctions." On 29 August 2017, the German politician and member of Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe Maria Louise Beck published a piece in Neue Zürcher Zeitung with a number of recommendations for EU on dealing with Russia and counteracting Kremlin propaganda. One of them is visa free regime for Russians in order to incorporate Russians into Western values and promote democratic change in Russia. In October 2018, the member of SPD and Bundestag deputy Dirk Wieser suggested granting visa-free EU entry to young Russians in order to facilitate student exchange programs. <laughs> <laughs> EU membership discussion Among the most vocal supporters of Russian membership of the EU has been former Italian Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi. In an article published to Italian media on 26 May 2002, he said that the next step in Russia's growing integration with the West should be EU membership. On 17 November 2005, he commented in regards to the prospect of such a membership that he is "...convinced that even if it is a dream it is not too distant a dream and I think it will happen one day." Berlusconi has made similar comments on other occasions as well. Later, in October 2008, he said, 
I consider Russia to be a Western country and my plan is for the Russian Federation to be able to become a member of the European Union in the coming years." And stated that he had this vision for years. Russian permanent representative to the EU Vladimir Chizhov commented on this by saying that Russia has no plans of joining the EU. Vladimir Putin has said that Russia joining the EU would not be in the interests of either Russia or the EU, although he advocated close integration in various dimensions including establishment of four common spaces between Russia and the EU, including united economic, educational and scientific spaces as it was declared in the agreement in 2003. Michael McFowell claimed in 2001 that Russia was decades away from qualifying for EU membership. Former German Chancellor Gerhard Schroeder has said that though Russia must find its place both in NATO, and, in the longer term, in the European Union, and if conditions are created for this to happen, that such a thing is not economically feasible in the near future. Czech President Milos Zeman stated that he dreams of Russia joining EU, according to a number of surveys carried out by Deutsche Welle in 2012, from 36% to 54% of Russians supported Russia joining EU, and about 60% of them saw EU as an important partner for their country. Young people have an especially positive image of the European Union. <laughs> <laughs> Russian public opinion A February 2014 poll conducted by the Levada Center, Russia's largest independent polling organization, found that nearly 80% of Russian respondents had a good impression of the EU. This changed dramatically in 2014 with the Ukrainian crisis resulting in 70% taking a hostile view of the EU compared to 20% viewing it positively. A Levada poll released in August 2018 found that 68% of Russian respondents believe that Russia needs to dramatically improve relations with Western countries. 42% of Russians polled said they had a positive view of the EU, up from 28% in May 2018. Topic. See also Armenia-European Union relations Belarus-European Union relations Common economic space of the CIS EU-Russia Center European Union Association Agreement Northern Dimension Russia in the European energy sector <laughs>